I'm very excited that we'll be talking about cybersecurity and implications for non-proliferation. This is a topic that has been in the news quite a bit recently, um, especially with regard to the Nantans nuclear power plant. So for pe perhaps our um, speaker will be able to address some of <laughs> the recent news highlights, but it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexi Drew to you. Um, Dr. Drew wears a variety of hats. She is a research associate at the Policy Institute of King's College London. She is also an associate fellow at Global Network on Extremism and Technology. And she serves as executive manager at the European Cyber Conflict Research Initiative. In addition to that, she is also part of the UK chapter leadership of Women in International Security and also serves as a mentor for Girl Security's mentorship program. Alexi's research focuses mainly on emerging technologies, the international norms surrounding them, as well as their impact on international relations and geopolitics. In particular, Alexi focuses a lot of her work on cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, of which I know there were already some questions related to that technology, information operations, platform governance, arms control, and algorithmic power, among others. She has published a variety of papers. She has a lot of publications in progress and has contributed to numerous op-eds as well as media outlets. So without further ado, Alexi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mara, for a fantastic introduction. And it's a pleasure to be um, working with the VC DMP again. Um, yeah, I, I always like to talk, obviously, cybersecurity being my, my field, it's one of those things I always wish we could move away from Stuxnet and the TANS, but apparently, um, that's going to be a, a area and a location which is going to keep coming up. Um, Stuxnet has shaped cybersecurity in not just the public eye, as it's understood, but also quite heavily in the policymaking eye for almost, well, over a decade now. And since then, we have, in my opinion, made some great inroads at moving away from the relatively limited lessons that were available to learn from that incident but unfortunately um, we keep getting dragged back to them so the events of this week um, are undoubtedly and have already um, made old questions resurface that perhaps actually don't provide the kind of nuance that we'd we'd like so what i'm going to do is cover what i think are really three three major topics that are going to play into the current events and then I imagine um, we'll probably have a lot of questions that focus on exactly what's happened this week, as well as apparently AI, which I'm happy to answer. But I'm going to look at um, some of the the big issues, or I think actually the sources of the major issues in cybersecurity with regards to proliferation and their use as a both a weapon and a defensive platform. I'm also going to talk about the issues that arise out of the less exciting concept of cyber concepts around cybersecurity, so the ones that perhaps don't grab headlines or perhaps don't quite seem so attractive to military um, individuals or policymakers, and then I'm going to finally conclude on a little bit of about some of the major sources of instability um, internationally as a result of cybersecurity issues. So starting off, it's it's my general belief that most of the issues that we see in international security today regarding cyber actually arise out of a lingering series of misconceptions about what cybersecurity actually is and what it does and what it means for most of us. Now, some of those have to do with who is involved in cybersecurity and setting standards in acting in this space. And some of them are misconceptions involving the how and the what and what cybersecurity actually looks like in practical terms. Now, the fundamentals come down to, I think, the who. If we look historically and we look at, say, just the, the, re the remit of arms control, arms control, generally speaking, is something which is negotiated and engaged upon between state actors or international institutions. And what has happened, in my opinion, is that the reality of that has changed rapidly within the vast platform that we call cyber or emerging technologies. This includes artificial intelligence, quantum computing, next generation telecommunications. Quite simply, those two categories of actors, international institutions and states, are definitely not the only actors in the room anymore. Not only that, the, there has not been a creation of more power or influence to even the share, it's actually simply been re reassigned to a new 
predominant or at least very prominent group of actors, that being private industry. Cybersecurity is a field and emerging technology is a field which is driven and shaped not predominantly by state actors or institutions that collect state interest, but by private companies. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a role for the state or even a variation of the role for the state within these dynamics. In the US and Europe, there's still a level of governance historically around cybersecurity issues and, and how these standards and technologies have not only been developed, but how they've then been employed and the risks and rewards surrounding them. In other cases, actually, there have been a far greater level of state direction and central stra strategy behind how these technologies have been adopted, designed and employed. Um, that is obviously the case with China and the CCP has a far more centrally orientated plan for how it develops and really strategically is the right word, uses emerging technologies for its benefit. Now, one of the things which is relatively recent in, in cyber terms, at least, which um, is a much narrower time frame than many other technologies, is that there's been a realization first by companies of the, the power that they hold. And secondly, unfortunately, by states that they don't hold all the power anymore. You have increasingly seen that the actors that are trying to shape and set standards of behavior in cyberspace are not actually states, nor are they the ones that are actually potentially having the most influence. In fact, it's companies such as Microsoft that are no, not only setting standards of what should be behavior in cyberspace, but then actively turning those, those discursive standards into practical efforts. Um, examples might be, if you like, the efforts of Microsoft in the run up to the US presidential election, where they were specifically targeting um, botnets and ransomware networks, which were expected to potentially undermine a presidential election. They did that through the legal processes of the US, but they decided to do that on their own without um, being inspired or driven to do so by, in this case, the state interest. So that is a dynamic which is I would argue perhaps not unique that, you know, there are other technology types that are, have this similar um, non-state driven dynamic of what security is and what stability is and how to achieve it. But it is one which I would argue has actually come about and come to prominence through a very unique set of dynamics of technology is no longer, or certainly cutting head, edge technology is no longer held or directed solely by state interest. It's now developed by private industry and that has a significant change in what um, international governance looks like and how it can be directed in a, in a manner which is beneficial to all. Um, private industry and the market does not always provide the public good, certainly not at a, a general a mass international level. And if we want to talk about where that happens most, international standards, which I believe Philippa mentioned a minute ago are a fantastic example of that. Um, technical standards in in cyber terms can be everything from the most boring um, standard of, of interoperability of, for example, USB. Um, the reason why USB is predominant around the world and used in almost every computing system is because international technical standards mandated that USB would be the de facto format and form factor for us plugging things into our computers. Now. This technology seems ethically um, neutral, it seems apolitical, and it seems to not really infer any particular power on any group, state or otherwise. However, what if the technology we're discussing is not a USB interface, but is in fact um, how algorithms interact with individuals like human beings? So what if it's in fact a system which sets or a stand, technological standard which builds into the next generation of technologies how it is or, or what to what level privacy should be the central concept of this technology because that's the kind of decision making which is now happening in international technical standards bodies like the um well the ito and the itu now these are ethical decisions they are also political decisions because whoever sets those standards gets to then essentially 
control what those standards look like and create the beneficial scenario for what they are going to both create themselves for their domestic mar markets, but also export. So standardization is a significant part of the Chinese Belts and Road Initiative, for example, because if you set the standard internationally, what tends to happen is countries with limited capacity for technical deliberation of their own will simply adopt those because it's easier, cheaper and more beneficial for them to do so. The risk with this is that we're seeing what is often perceived by policymakers as a dry, uninteresting and unimportant realm of international governance is actually being leveraged as a means of doing exactly the opposite of creating significant pull, pulling of power for a particular region or in this case state and also potentially undermining our ability to ensure that the next generation of technologies are fit with our normative and ethical standards and that is something which we need to really push back on now i want to move on to the another really boring concept of cyber security which actually is more important than most people think and that's supply chains um, you might have heard for example of the recent um attack or well, attack is the wrong word but solar winds incident with the united states which actually was much broader than just the us where a vendor of a remote access tool used to manage large networks for businesses and in this case also government departments in the us was infiltrated by not just russian but also chinese um, operatives and then essentially used to gain significant access to both private companies like microsoft but also government um, departments in the us and elsewhere now the reason why this attack or this 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 piece of cyber espionage was successful was because solar winds is a private company used by lots of other second private industries and government organizations but because it was private it wasn't beholden to the same level of oversight or security that say a defense a defense manufacturer or a government agency themselves would be in the production of the same capacity so supply chains create this broader what we would call um, an attack surface. So they create greater opportunity for these um, potential offensive incidents to target uh, rather than giving you something which is what we would prefer, a very small attack surface, which say would be a system developed in-house solely for that one company or that one agency. Instead, because of solar winds in this case the company that was targeted being such a large um, company which was surfacing or servicing so many other companies they were a, a prime vector for this this piece of of targeting now the major problem that happened with this in terms of which again illuminates the continuing issue of cybersecurity in the in the proliferation space in the policy space is that pretty much every US politician who grappled with this realization started using terminology like this isn't a cyber attack or an inc incident of cyber warfare that requires a response. Now it's not, um, quite frankly and quite simply. This was an incident more akin to cyber espionage, which is actually the predominance of the activity that we see in this space, not cyber warfare, not cyber conflict, cyber espionage. It was never intended to cause damage or to minimize the operability of the systems it targeted. And that, that is a very distinct difference. We very rarely see incidents which are either less clear in their, are they espionage or an attack? And we even more rarely see ones which are obviously a, a, an aggressive use or an offensive use designed to destroy, limit, or, or essentially make inaccessible the digital or technical system and that's why i find the events that happened or apparently happened this week in a tans um, annoying in a, in a sense because it makes it much harder to re-inject that nuance into the debate of what cybersecurity is all about because when you have what is apparently a cyber attack carried out by the israeli government against again the iranian enrichment facility which caused physical damage you suddenly once again see the the usage of this incident to define an entire range of activities which actually are normally far below this threshold of potential escalation now 
that brings us on to the key one of what I think is the key instability issue or risk of instability with cybersecurity. It's the risk of escalation due to lack of knowledge. And a lot of that lack of knowledge is actually as a result of intentional um, policy by by both states and institutions. So NATO, for example, has for quite some time suggested that a cyber attack can breach the mutual defense clause of its treaty with its member states. But it's never clarified what kind of cyber attack, what it would need to do, who would need to target, what would the impact need to be. The reasoning behind this is that if you set what that standard is, then every aggressor will simply try and achieve them as most they can underneath this threshold. So this ambiguity is meant to be in a way a, a, a means of widening the deterrent for using a, a cyber means to attack uh, a NATO member. Now, this makes some sense and it's a, a means really of adapting um, historic and non-cyber dynamics to a cyber realm. The problem with that is, is that this opacity of what is acceptable and what is beneath this threshold has actually simply seen a massive ramp in what actors do in this space. It also means that it's very hard in an existing incident of, of conflict or escalation to understand where the line is and where to draw it and signaling being what it is at the moment in terms of, of proper communication on diplomatic and non-diplomatic channels, that is an e even greater risk than usual. Throw into the fact that cyber happens at a pace far beyond traditional forms of interstate conflict. And you have another issue is the fact that unlike the time it takes for a missile to fly or a infantry battalion to move, a cyber attack can take place instantaneously. Um, it also is a result of the fact that a cyber attack often, if it is intended to be offensive, will rarely be limited purely to the region or target that it was actually intended for. A case in point would be an attack carried out by um, a Russian state against, uh, in this case, um, a Ukrainian system or Ukrainian government system, which went through a financial, um, or rather, I think it was a import export tool that was used for financial accounting. The problem with that was, or that particular attack is that same tool was used by lots of other non-Ukrainian companies, in this case, Mask, the shipping company, which suffered a huge financial loss as a result of having to replace a large amount of its infected systems. So this was, if you like, splash damage, where you might have seen, a, even if it was an acceptable um, path of escalation, it wasn't just the intended target that was affected. So they had wider consequences. And that is a very common trend in cyber offense and defense balancing. So there's a, a problem there too. And the final thing I kind of want to, to raise in this sense is that cyber capability is rapidly proliferating. It has an ease of proliferation, which is not unique, but certainly different from, from its predecessors in this space. It's a lot easier to proliferate the means of um, both defending and being aggressive in cyberspace than it is for physical um, means of doing the same thing. It, you can spread it through the dissemination of techniques or methods. You can spread it through the dissemination of lines of code. You can spread it through the dissemination of the, the exploits used to gain access to the systems which you then want to influence. And you can spread it through consultants who have been trained by a security service in one company, ending their time in that country and then seeking employment <laughs> in many cases in a state that is actually directly um, aligned against the country that actually trained them in those skills in the first place. And that is, well, that's a dynamic that's not unique. It is one which is becoming increasingly prevalent. And these are the kinds of dynamics and issues that we are faced uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, both educating policymakers on the unique functions and dynamics in this this field and this this range but also trying to steer them away from the headline capturing incidents where cyber actually causes something to catch fire which i have to stress again as i end my my spiel those are the incredibly rare incidents 
And the problem with those is that they might be rare, but they're far more newsworthy than the ones that are the most common type. And that still remains one of our major barriers to effective policy making and, and discourse is that the little rare incidents massively color the, the general dynamics. And when we try and talk about this um, in, in governance space. And that I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Um, if there are any questions, I would love to hear them and I'd love to do my best to answer. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alexi, for your remarks and also for, for clarifying some of the differences in terminology between when we're talking about a cyber attack versus cyber espionage. And of course, the, the headline that just so happened to, <laughs> to come to surface this week, which makes your talk particularly timely. Um, as was the case for the last session, um, we are happy to invite you to ask your questions live. So to do so, please raise your hand. And I, you are also welcome to, to indicate so in the chat. I did receive um, an indication in chat from Sila Selen um, Twerkel. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but yes. um, yeah. please to ask your question. Uh, thank you for the talk, firstly. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, actually North Korea. Uh, since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, North Korea has taken aggressive actions, measures, and uh, has not reported a single case. However, in February, uh, North, North Korean hackers uh, tried to steal uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, vac vaccine uh, technology from the Pfizer. Uh, so it is possible to happen similar uh, attacks by hackers from the countries, uh, the countries they uh, don't reach the vaccines. I wonder the trend of the cyber attacks uh, with the effect of pandemic. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. And it, it's one that is definitely worth answering. The, so to, to tackle, first of all, the North Korea issue, North Korea has a history in terms of its use of cyber offensive capability to try and supplement the interests of the state in general terms. So this includes a lot of activities involving um, theft of financial um, data or, in fact, currency itself. They have a significant role in cryptocurrency mining and cryptocurrency theft, for example. Um, but in terms of the general dynamic around cyber in the pandemic, there has been a significant increase in attacks targeting or directly targeting healthcare systems, so including ransomware, which encrypts um, health, well, encrypts whatever machine it hits and generally then holds essentially it demands some form of financial payment to unencrypt it. The, the thing to bear in mind is that there are for every state orientated hacking group or state aligned hacking group, there are about 20 or 30 others which are criminal in nature and they often look for opportunities. And in, for them, a pandemic has actually created significant opportunities. So there have been st instances of state hacking targeting the data around vaccines, the North Korea one being a perfect example of that. But there's also been significant number of financially motivated attacks against industries that are of more critical importance now as a result of the pandemic than they would perhaps normally be. And there has definitely been a spike in those kinds of attacks targeting healthcare systems, hospitals, um, and research labs as well. So it definitely does have a have an overlap. So you're you're very right to bring that up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see we have more hands being raised. So the next person who I'm going to give the floor to is Denisa. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation, first of all. Well, it's really fascinating what, she, what you presented, and um, I hope my question makes sense. Um, I would like to know if um, who controls what in the cyberspace, because you mentioned that states are not the main, the most important actors. Mm -hmm. So like, from a geopolitical, geopolitical point of view, um, is there uh, any uh, um, any any uh, battle or uh, a war of of, uh, of control in the cyberspace? Thank yeah, you. That that is a great question um, and one that I could probably spend a very long time talking about. So I would argue perhaps that cyberspace and, and 
the realm of cyber as a as a geopolitical field is one which is 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 naturally multilateral and multi-stakeholder but not all of the stakeholders have worked that out yet um there has been in the governance space there's been a long-running set of attempts to create normative standards in cyberspace the un gge has been running since i think or has been instigated since around 2005 or 4 um, with the russians actually raising it first in the 1990s in the technical standards space we've had international institutions for technical standards setting since before the internet and continue and will no doubt continue to do so for some time the issue i i think is that we we now face is that historically the leaders in innovation and, and, and research and development have been the us and the eu to a lesser extent and their means of governance and their means of essentially deciding on what these these technologies look like has been essentially a, a privatized form of standardization and a privatized set of normal developments where we've allowed the market to to essentially dictate who has what power and with the odd nudge from from states when we think behavior is perhaps unsuitable the problem we have is that there are there is increasingly a a division um, as a new state actor takes increasing or new state actors i should say take an increasing role in that market space and these state actors notably china but also india and other countries like this have a very different approach to governance of private industry when it comes to research and development and technologies unlike the us that simply allows the market to do what it will in many cases with a very light touch um, China, for example, has a very centralized direction for what standards should be and what technology should be developed and who should develop them and what will be done with them once they are developed. And the problem we now face is that the, the war in geopolitics, as it were, over these standards is taking place with only one side aware that it's happening um, and only one side aware that actually they've managed to tailor the means in which they, they gain this advantage to counter the failings of a market driven approach and we're only i say we i mean the eu us and, and partners we're only just realizing that actually we need to take a firmer hand in governance to make sure that we regain not a competitive advantage but even balance in how these how these technologies will be developed in future thank you alexi for explaining the complexities about us not having unified standards globally and <laughs> the challenges associated with that. The next person um, who's on my list is Stella Blumfeld. Yes, hello. Thank you again for the presentation. And uh, I'm really grateful that you highlighted the frustrations of definition and uh, actors and so on, because it's really a relative issue. Uh, my, I have a few questions, but I'll try to shape them to less. The first one is, do you think the case of Australia and what happened back in February with them taming big tech could be a model that could potentially be used in general to uh, gain back the, let's say, state power over private companies in cyber domain. And the second would be, why do you think democratic countries mask their signaling of a uh, cyber attacks instead, for example, like uh, autocratic regimes that instead they try to uh, attribute them, attribute those to themselves. And the last one is, uh, what do you think is the Global South role in uh, shaping internet governance? Thank you very much. Again, um, great set of questions. So in, in terms of, I mean, I mean, the attribution question is actually an important one. So I'm going to kind of focus on that and then i think see if i can answer the other two connected to it so attribution is attribution in, in cyber is actually takes two main roles or two main influences one is technical and the other is political attribution in cyberspace is predominantly i would argue actually not a technical one it's certainly not limited by technical means it's limited by a political one so it used to be an unfortunate and inaccurate belief 
that attribution in cyberspace was either incredibly difficult or in fact impossible. In reality, that's not the case at all. Um, attribution in cyberspace is complex, yes, but we have developed quite significant capacity to work out where an attack came from, and probably in many cases in quite significant detail. And again, this is another scenario where it's not just states that do this now. Private industry exists just to attribute cyber attacks. You can look at companies like FireEye, for example. But when it comes to whether states attribute attacks, either to themselves or others, the decision behind this is predominantly one about politics. If you're attributing to yourself and you're saying we have done this, that is a means of sending a signal to both the aggressor or the target of your attack and to the international community as a whole. So, for example, if you want um, a case where an attack was openly attributed with a little bit of a, a side, when the, I think it was the Dutch actually, um, attributed the attack against the chemical weapons establishment by Russia, their, their direct calling out actually went into a lot more detail than it would usually do. And the reasoning behind that is political, not technical. So every incident where attribution is made technically, the level of information involved would have been the same or close to as this, as the Dutch managed to gather in this case. What was interesting and relatively unique was the amount of detail they went into in the open attribution of the source of this attack. Because what they did is go into further detail of the capacity they had to access the side that they were accusing of being aggressive in this instant. And it was demonstrating their own capability in doing that. So that's essentially sending a signal going, not only do we know you did it, we know you did it, we know how you did it, we know where you did it from. And if you do it again, we will do more than just a tribute because we're already in your systems looking at what you're doing. And that is a very political thing to do. It's a very strong signal to send. The EU recently has developed a, a cyber diplomacy toolkit, which has a significant lean towards open and shared attribution between EU member states. And I think it's a a very good um, toolkit. I think it's one which actually has a significant chance of having a, a stabilizing impact. In fact, it's great to see even post Brexit, the United Kingdom is building into its own cyber strategy an attribution component that that still aligns at least semi with the, the EU one, which would have been beholden, well, a part of otherwise, which is good. It's also bringing the US involved more from what we're seeing and other nations. So Canada has been involved in a lot of joint attribution recently. So that dynamic is good. Um, in terms of the Global South, I think the Global South has quite a, a big role to play in, in standard setting. And I think it has a, a big role to play, which unfortunately is counteracted at the moment with a very limited understanding of what that is and the nature of cybersecurity issues within the Global South. There's been a historic predominance of looking at cybersecurity as a thing that only really impacts or is influenced by European or, or Canadian or North American states, which is not accurate. There are unique dynamics in the global south that not only create security issues within the region itself, but externally as well and can have an impact elsewhere. I think a great example of this is the how the interplay of limited capacity for standard setting interacts with international institutions where certain parties can have dominance in setting those. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, a standard set in the ITU, for example, uh, is likely to be adopted by third countries if they don't have the capacity to create their own, um, which means that what you'll see in the global south is essentially a, a proxy conflict between warring technical standards in an international domain that are being adopted without um, contention without domestic understanding either the, the context of what's going to happen with them later down the line. Then that's because capacity is a, has become this, this recognized issue or the lack of limited capacity has become a recognized issue in cybersecurity, but not one which has been ironically given much capacity to solve. Um, Unidir has done some great work, for example, pointing out the security implications of limited capacity in um, digital security to um, the global south, but nothing has actually seemingly done by those who have the ability to do so, and that I think is a is a big flaw. So the global south will have a big role to play. Um, hopefully, they'll be able to be 
um, assisted in developing the capacity to to take matters into their own hands and do so from their own position rather than be overtly in, or covertly influenced by others. Thank you very much, Alexi. Thank you. <laughs> and you see, also very much appreciated your response. <laughs> um, the next person on my list is Eleonora Kosani. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon to everyone, or good morning, or good evening. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And my question might be a little bit more theoretical. So you mentioned the definition of language ambiguity that runs around the cybersecurity field, for example, with cyber attack and cyber espionage. And I am slightly more aware of the same ambiguity with definition and language when it comes to non-proliferation. So for example, with CBRN or WMD and the application of this ambiguity. So my question is, is there a tangible issue related to this ambiguity and have there been any effort from scholars and academia to set this ambiguity straight? Thank you. So, so I can answer the, the last part of that question straight away is that, um, and give you an, a kind of a, an idea of how that's happened. Um, there's a great conference that takes place in The Hague every year, um, apart from last year, which I massively missed out on because I, I like my trip to the Netherlands at least once a year, but it's a conference on cyber norms. Um, it's been running for, I think, the fourth year will be um, this November coming. And last year was the first time where there was a significant number of papers that were talking about the norms of cyber espionage as opposed to the norms of cyber conflict. And I think this is reflective of how academia has, has matured in the cybersecurity space in the last five or six years. We've gone from the the big disambiguation problems of what is cyber warfare and will it happen to realization that actually maybe cyber warfare isn't the thing that is happening and the actual thing is cyber espionage which has a very different set of of dynamics around it but i think so there are there are scholars like dennis broders who have done some good work in this space and are actually i think leading the charge in it but the disambiguation thing persists um particularly when trying to translate academia into policy language. Um, a great example of how the technical, the political, and the policy interacts in a negative or an unhelpful way is the realization that in reality, the technologies behind cyber offense and cyber defense are the same technologies and not different. The, the technology that you use to carry out or research an offensive capacity is exactly the same as you would use to research and deploy a defensive capacity. And that is not something that is grasped in um, political science, academic concept of cybersecurity very well, or in, in certainly in many cases, but it is getting better. It's one that's very, very well understood in the kind of information security, the technical perspective, but he hasn't translated very well to academia. But academia has done better on the very far end of that spectrum is policy, where they look or well, there is still this con conception very strongly held that there is a difference between the developing of offensive capability and the defense development of defensive capability there is very little um, and it is very hard particularly from an external position to look at what a state or an actor might be doing and researching and go that is for defense and that is for offense most emerging technologies are fundamentally dual use and many of them are fundamentally um, two sides of a sword that can be used for defending or offensive activity at the same time. Um, and to make a decision from the outside looking in is incredibly hard. And that's a great example of how this disambiguation of concepts and language translates into a policy space. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Alexi. That was very fascinating. and. I think it's true sometimes when we talk about defense and offense, especially in this realm, it's easy to, to think we're talking about two different tools and tactics, whereas um, oftentimes it could be similar, but, but the end goal is different. Um, the next person on my list, and I apologize in advance if I'm mispronouncing your name, is Awanaf Hajer. Sorry, <laughs> please correct me with the pronunciation. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's correct. It's Anna Hadjar. So thank you so much for uh, 
this presentation and for these great topics to discuss about. So bearing in mind that cybersecurity is part of human rights, so isn't time for government to, if I'm right, to, go, to, uh, to form a charter for human rights, detailed charter for human rights, because as he said, uh, as you said, sorry, it's a geopolitical space that needs for legislations. Thank you. That is fundamentally exactly the case. Um, you, one of the problems we have, I think, is that there is there is a difference in pace and pace of recognition of the implications of these technologies on human rights and the pace of, of action after this recognition. So if you want to look at the top end, like the, the best practice, um, things like GDPR in the EU is a great example of a recognition of the, not just a recognition of the rights of privacy to the individual, but a, a creation of essentially a legal framework, which then operationalizes that recognition. And the great thing about GDPR in this case is because of the, the nature of the EU block and how it's done, it's had implications beyond the EU. I mean, a lot of American companies adopted GDPR as a standard simply because it was too costly to have two parallel systems of practice. So that's a good thing. On the completely opposite hand of that, however, you have areas and places where um, these technologies are viewed as an opportunity for authoritarianism and not for one of, of creating a public good or, or balancing the risks of authoritarianism misuse to create uh, a system of public good. And what we see here is that there are some actors that perhaps in an international perspective or an international institution would not only be in favor of, but would quite happily um, work towards an updated version of a human rights concept to include things like privacy, ownership of information and data, um, the lack of algorithmic bias, etc. However, there are still um, powerful um, state actors that do not recognize that. And what they see instead is an opportunity to misuse, in my opinion, these technologies for their own domestic um, security, for, for the, not for the people, but for themselves as a, as a party or a group. And these are, these are unfortunate realities that are, have not yet been got over. And I would, I would love to say that we are on a fast track to the recognition of what we, we should be doing with these, te these technologies and the whole, the whole gamut of them, but we're not. Um, and in fact, in many cases, we see it going back the other direction and opportunities to correct and course correct are, are not taken up. And I think that I can only hope that people who ask questions like that in this room can be part of the solution to that problem. So that would be great to see and maybe um, counter some of my cynicism in this space. It's very nice of you to end on a note of optimism in your response. I try. <laughs> um, the next person I have on my list is Sonia Nath. Hi, thank you so much for your interesting discussion on a very needed topic, cybersecurity threats. So my question, uh, my question, what do you suggest for nuclear weapon states? How they can secure their nuclear command and control system from cyber threats in the age of emerging technologies? Thank you. Well, this is a, this is a great example of, of what I said, connected to what I said before about offensive and defensive capacity. Um, much, much in the same regards, any offensive or any cyber capacity developed that can say target a banking system or financial system is likely the same tool and the same process and, and vector that could be used to target nuclear command and control. So how do nuclear states encourage or rather discourage um, activities and the use of capacity that could undermine that? Quite simply, they do better at um proffering cyber norms of stability and they do better at creating capacity outside of just the nuclear states and they do better at normalizing technical standards which are garnered towards an open transparent and secure internet as opposed to one which allows them to continue to operate um, for their own interest beyond or below 
those thresholds and breaking their own rules. Um, it, it, you can't be a norm entrepreneur for stability and lack of, and, and, and against escalation if you yourself engage in activities which fundamentally undermine those. And I think my biggest issue with not just the nuclear states, but pretty much anyone with a developed cyber capability that they use offensively is that those who put on the right face of trying to argue for stability and norms of a mutual self interest or mutual interest and non-aggression are often those that engage in the most complex and potentially destabilizing acts of cyber espionage or in some cases um like in israel and iran this week the ones that are very very overt and that is a behavior that does not benefit um, stability of any kind and including um, the potential risk to nuclear command and control i i personally think that there's a very strong um set of implicit norms about non attacks against those kinds of infrastructures but those should not be the only protection or deterrence for those sort of things we need better um, action all around i think perfect Thank you very much, Alexi. I currently don't see anyone else on my list of questions. If you do have a question, please either raise your hand or indicate in the chat. But while we have a little bit of time, perhaps I can ask some questions of my own. <laughs> and one of my questions is kind of relevant to what Sonia was getting at, and that is how vulnerable are our nuclear facilities to cyber attack. With the current incident that did occur in the news, there's been different reflections about um, Iran's capabilities being set back by a couple of days, others say an entire month. And I'm just wondering, when, when we talk about cyber sabotage that does actually have a physical impact as well, how, how grave could the danger be? Um, what is the extent and the impact that such attacks could actually have? And in that regard, um, well, speaking of this, I guess the other question is when, when you look at the threat of nuclear versus the threat of a cyber sabotage on a nuclear plant, what is truly the greater risk, especially given that cyber sabotage has, um, you can have more perpetrators at a lower cost <laughs> and they don't necessarily have to be on site, so. So in, in terms of the, the risk to nuclear infrastructure, I, I would argue that the, that most of those engaged or most of those nuclear states who have weaponized capacity are going to invest significant amounts, particularly in modernized sense at defending or securing um, their networks from or those particular networks from access. And if you are if you are a government agency with the resources required to create a nuclear capability, you have the resources to make an incredibly secure networked infrastructure like incredibly secure to the point that access to it let alone actually causing harm to it is incredibly complex difficult and costly and the costs obviously are not purely financial the costs are political um, and in terms of and, and diplomatic as well and those all have very significant restraining factors there's a reason why the the events of this week are <laughs> occurring in the same place again because the particular dynamic in this region is one which is unique, um, including the dynamic of um, c capability of the actors involved. The issue for me, the biggest risk of this particular incident and the, and the growing repetitiveness of it and the actors involved is that Iran is not the same cyber power as it was in 2010, by far. And, and to, I, would, I would query the logic behind continuing in this approach considering the huge investment that iran has made in its own cyber capability so even beyond a traditional military response or an escalation to this kind of attack and the repercussions of it my greatest fear is actually that we see an escalation of cyber um, conflict between the two um, because iran is not a pushover in this space anymore by any means in fact it's by far one of the most developed in this space in the region um, we've not yet seen them engage in an attack of a type like has been targeted against them and the risk of retaliation of that would be quite high i would think um 
in terms of the, the second component of your, your question, in terms of, um, sorry, remind me, the second section was, I lost my own track of thought there. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, looking at what it, what is the greater risk, also noting that cyber attacks, there, yeah. there are more perpetrators, it is. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think the issue with, the difference between, say, emerging technology or the risks of emerging technology is as a, as a means of escalation or a, a means of conflict between states. The difference with it is, is that unlike a use of a nuclear or biological chemical weapon, we see cyber attacks of some type on a daily basis. Um, and I could point to incidents for quite some time that have been targeting infrastructure. Now, there are very few instances, in fact, none, where we have seen the death of an individual from a cyber attack. Absolutely zero. There was one incident recently that came close that was a ransomware attack against a healthcare facility in Germany, um, where an individual died as a result of systems being inaccessible. Turns out that after further investigation, there wasn't an implication of that, that lockout of access causing the person's death. So we've never seen an incident where a person dies as a result of a cyber attack, espionage or otherwise. The issue for me is that cyber is increasingly becoming part of escalation pathways for more traditional forms of conflict between state actors. And my fear is, is that as these attacks become more common and the restraint around them lessens as is of the potential, they actually lead to greater escalation to more kinetic means that do risk human life because they are faster, they're less understood. The dynamics and signaling around them are more complex um, because of the speed, but also ambiguity. And I think those therefore, that cyber therefore poses a greater risk as perhaps a, an escalation step than it does uh, a means of causing physical harm itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to the audience again to offer one last time for anyone to raise their hand or pose a question. Otherwise, I will continue my conversation with Alexi before I know she'll have to leave us. So any questions or hands? No. One question um, I do want to ask you, Alexi, as well. Oh, I, I do see it. I do have a hand all of a sudden. Hold on. <laughs> Enough. I'm happy to give you the floor again. <laughs> You're, you're currently muted, so. Okay, now you can hear me. So I have a quick question. Uh, in your opinion, um, is the cyber backwardness of some countries a blessing or a curse? Oh, that is, that is a big question. Um, I think it depends on... Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the countries under development, etc. I think I think the the question would depend on the answer. To the question would depend on how you frame it, and from what perspective. I think for the for the states themselves, there's who are perhaps behind um, their peers. The the issue would be the potential for them to be, in a way, influenced in a direction that doesn't actually benefit them in the longer term. So there's a potential for misuse of them as a as a component of a wider geopolitical trend or conflict between other parties i personally i think that's the, the same is true on a on a wider scale i think that the development of of global governance depends upon equal and equitable equitable inputs from all parties involved and that includes non-state actors and and private industry as i've pointed out those are their key components but it should also include inputs of all states that have a stake in the future of these technologies which isn't just those who currently have an advanced capacity in them and it's all states and i think therefore that the fact that there are those um, states that don't benefit from this they don't have the capacity and the capability to engage in governments governance discussions actually is in general a a negative um, it's a it's a bad thing for global governance as a whole because without their inputs, we're, we're shaping a, a form of global governance that potentially will come up against problems in the later term as these states 
develop into the position that we are perhaps in now and realize that 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 system has not been designed for them because they haven't had the inputs that they should have done and i think that generally then my answer is that it, it's a curse we we should develop or de yeah we should give more resources to the the capacity building in third states and allow them then to actually take part as equal partners in global governance discussions and deliberations Thank you very much, Alexi. That was a very, a very interesting question and a great response. So thank you for sharing those insights. We are reaching the end of the session. So what I would like to do, um, seeing no other hands or questions in the chat, is to offer you um, a minute or two just to provide us with your concluding remarks and the main messages you hope we take away from today's session. So I, I think the biggest thing that I would like anyone to take away is that don't believe the headlines for one. Um, cyber is one of those headline grabbing things that the nuance and the realities and the actual general trends of what this field is like is swamped in the news articles that come out from well meaning but often informed individuals and that also unfortunately translates into policy decision a lot of the time. Um, so ignore the headlines. Um, look to the general trends and the increasingly good academic work which has greater nuance and more critical analysis of these issues as opposed to the buzzwords of cyber war and cyber weapons there's far more to it than than those terms and the final thing and this has been touched on by most of the questions if i'm honest is if you are reading into the space beware confusing definitions and beware people who say one thing but mean something entirely different from it and it can make navigating these particular waters very difficult um, and it often means that most of these papers start with about 500 words of definitions about concepts that you've seen so many other times that mean different things and finally i i think i'd like to say i'm encouraged to see so many people here with an interest of different backgrounds and from different regions and locations because that is a although we've come very far in this field the biggest thing that we still lack is diversity of, of inclusion of perspectives, and we need more of that. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see some of that represented here, and I hope it continues. Thank you very much, Alexi. Um, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank you for taking the time to join us today and for your insightful remarks. And I would like to thank all the participants for asking their terrific questions. And please do join me in a round of virtual applause to our speaker. Yay. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, Alexi, and good luck with your other meetings today. I'm looking forward to fininishing them so I can get away from Zoom calls, but thank you very much for having me and enjoy the rest of your day.